Set the lights, or it's okay like this. I will set the lights. Okay. Okay. Fine. All right. Uh, okay. Wallace, you, wait. Where's Wallace? I'm here. Uh, I'm here. We can't see him though. Did you turn oh, yeah. off your video? Oh, wait. Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay, now it works. Uh, all right. So I was told that we have two screens here, and one is you. <laughs> Yes. You quite so one big okay, screen no. to the left is uh, Sheshwan's data, and to the right is you. So you're competing. <laughs> okay, so I won't like pick my nose or anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so try not to. <laughs> um, okay, so I was told that it's kind of custom to say just a few words. So I'll, I'll just say just two sentences. But uh, for me, this is kind of exciting because Sheshwan is my first uh, um, graduate student and maybe my last uh, mentor. Um, uh, and um, my first, I, 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 people told me that it'll take me months to find, uh, uh, oh wait, more people are coming in. Uh, when I first opened my lab, uh, people told me not to expect great grad students in the first uh, half year or something, it'll take some time. And um, that proved false. Um, because uh, on my first day here, uh, Shishwan came, and um, on my first uh, uh, meeting with her, she asked me, um, what project can I work on? And I talked to her about a few things, and then I showed, let me show you something on the whiteboard, and I showed her this calculation. She looks at the calculation, she stares at it, then she stares at me, and then she says, nope, you're wrong. <laughs> and with that, I knew that I found uh, the ideal uh, student, and, um, and I wasn't wrong. So I'm going to end with that. And Shishwan. Thank you. I, I have this. Oh, okay. So should I turn this off? Okay. So I'm turning the light. So can everyone hear me clearly? Um, okay. Thank you all for coming to my PhD seminar. Um, it's such a great pleasure today to see so many faces or friends and colleagues here today. And before I start, I'd like to first thank you for being my greatest company along my PhD journey. Uh, I'd like you to know that you have made a great difference in making my PhD years so much more fun and colorful. So, um, and also I want to say that uh, I received so much help and support from so many people, uh, including you, that I can achieve my first step towards a research career. Um, so today I'm very excited to share with you my progress over the years. And I hope you may all enjoy, so please feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. So during my PhD, I've been working on the mechanisms of cell size control in mammalian cells. And specifically, I focus on how growth in cell size coordinates with cell cycle progression. So as a brief introduction to cell size, I'd like to show you this tissue section picture of the pancreas. So in the center, you have a population of these very tiny pancreatic beta cells, but just surrounding them are much larger SNR cells. And such contrast in cell size is not a unique phenomenon. Cells from different tissues seem to all have their unique target size. But within each tissue, cells are quite uniform in their size. So how are individual cells within the tissue regulated to reach and maintain the same specific size. So to answer this question, one of the proposed hypotheses is there may exist a cell size checkpoint at G1S transition that will only allow cells within the proper range to enter S phase. And following this hypothesis, cells with a small initial size will tend to grow for a longer period of time in G1 before they reach the right size while well, the cells that's born large will pro pro tend to progress quickly into S phase. So in the end, both cells will exit G1 with more similar sizes. So here I'd like to show you one of the several experiments where we confirmed this uh, relationship between cell size and G1 length. So we used time-lapse microscopy to monitor the dynamics of cell size throughout the cell cycle and we use two fluorescent reporters. One labels the nucleus, which we, use, we can use as a proxy of cell size, and the other is a cell cycle marker from which we can identify S-phase entry, so here. So this is 
um, the trajectory of one single cell that we track from one mitosis to the next division. So we use the method to track hundreds of individual cells and repeatedly we observe this negative correlation between initial size at birth and the corresponding G1 length. It's not, uh, it's weak but very consistent uh, negative correlation. So this confirms that cells born with a small initial size indeed uh, tend to compensate with a longer G1. And this coordination between cell size and G1 length forms a negative feedback to regulate cell size. And it can function like a thermostat to maintain the homeostasis of cell size. So what are the molecules that link cell size to regulate G1 progression and to maintain the homeostasis? And maybe you might guess it's the mTOR pathway, which is one of the most well-studied signaling involved in cell size control. It has been known for over two decades that activation of mTOR results in increasing size by upregulating protein translation and conversely, inhibition of mTOR results in smaller cell size. But as we looked in more detail, we found that mTOR pathway does not, or at least is not required for the coordination between cell size and G1 length. So as you see in this figure here, it's the dynamics, average dynamics of cell size throughout time uh, from after mitosis. And you see that cells under mTOR inhibition by rapamycin grow much slower compared to the control. So you see the rate is almost half of the uh, DMSO control. But the cells also compensate with a 40% longer G1 duration. So in the end, cell size, when they enter S phase, they're only slightly smaller in size. So this suggests a model where mTOR regulates cell size by modulating the rate of cell growth uh, through protein translation, it is not involved in this coordination between cell size and G1 length. So my PhD project aims to identify the molecules that link cell size to regulate G1 progression and maintain the overall homeostasis of cell size. And towards this aim, we performed two parallel screens. So the first is a very large-scale drug screen in which we search for the compounds that would lead to uncontrolled size phenotype. And the second is a much smaller scale screen, which we looked under unperturbed conditions, what pathways are selectively activated in these abnormally sized cells, potentially to bring these cells back to a normal size. And quite strikingly, these two screens that's performed and analyzed independently have pointed to the same direction, the P38 MAP kinase pathway. So let me first show you how we identify P38 uh, from the drug screen. So here is a flow chart of the screen. Uh, the whole procedure is quite straightforward and can be finished within three days. So on the first day, the cells were seated evenly across different wells in multiple plates. And then on the second day, the cells were treated with different compounds. So each well here is a different drug condition. And then after 24 hour drug treatment, the cells were fixed and stained and we use uh, fluorescent imaging as our readout. So in this study, we have screened for over 3,000 compounds. And a big advantage is that all these compounds has been very extensively annotated, uh, not only the primary targets, but also the lower affinity targets as well. And in addition, these compound targets covers the representatives of the druggable human protein. Uh, so this brings us a method to kind of unbiasedly assay the molecules involved in cell size control. Uh, here is a histogram highlighting the different functional categories targeted by the compounds included in the library. And this has been a very collaborative uh, collaboration with Jeremy Jenkins' lab at Novartis. So in our uh, screen, we used a four-color labeling strategy to assay for both cell size and cell cycle stage. So we have one color that labeled total protein content, uh, which we can use as uh, the macromolecular cell mass. And we have other three colors for the cell cycle. So one of them labels DNA by DAPI. And the cells also constitutively uh, express the two FUCHI cell cycle reporter, Gemini and CDT1, both of which express a different level across the cell cycle stage. So you can see uh, in our screen, we can generate single cell resolution data uh, at uh, 
uh, four, at four dimensions. So it's really each screen condition, we have thousands of single cells, and each cell we have this four dimensional data. So it's quite uh, information rich. And before I move to this uh, result, I'd like to note here again that cell size in the screen is not measured by the sectional area of the cells in the image because uh, we know that animal cells are quite irregular in their shape. Actually, they can spread out uh, or they can round up. So if you just look at the area of the cell in the image, it's not faithful me measure of neither cell volume nor cell mass. So instead, we use this protein dye called succinidia ester, which can react to all the proteins in the cells, and we can measure total protein content. And here on the right, uh, it's comparison between our method, so the y-axis our method, with quantitative phase microscopy, which measures cellular dry mass. And as you can see, these two methods are highly correlated at single cell level. And the advantage of using this protein dye is that it's very convenient, can be used in high throughput, and also at the same time, it's very sensitive to measure cell mass as well. So since its publication by Ryan uh, in 2013, it has been gradually accepted as a general way to measure cell mass uh, in our field. Uh, so back to the screen results. So as I mentioned, each well, uh, we have over, we captured over 5,000 single cells. So each point uh, here is a single cell. And this is four dimensional. So every well can be characterized by a four dimensional scatter plot like this. So here I'm showing you an example of one control well in the screen. Each point is single cell. And uh, we have the joint measurement of both cell size and cell cycle stage. I'm using color to distinguish the small size cells like the blue data points here versus large size cells like the yellow and red ones here. And the three axes are the cell cycle markers. So the location of the points indicate their cell cycle stage. So for example, DNA here, uh, one means two NDNA and two means four NDNA. So, uh, and within this unsynchronized cell population, we have cells scattered across different cell cycle stages. So let me walk you through this a bit. Um, so you see this population of cells here. It has two NDNA, low level of both Gemini and CDT1, indicating they are early G1 cells <laughs> just exit mitosis. And then the, as they accumulate more CDT1, uh, these cells, uh, they're in the later G1 stage. And then you see this fast degradation of the CDT1 reporter uh, indicating activation of SCF and SG1S transition. And following that, uh, you see this population of cells here spanning uh, on the DNA axis uh, between 2N and 4N DNA. So these are cells under DNA synthesis, therefore in S phase. And in the end, we have a large population of cells here with 2N, uh, 4N DNA uh, for the G2 phase cells. So you see this is uh, quite information rich uh, and we can uh, develop different metrics to assay how these compounds affect different phenotypes. So we can, for example, assay how the compounds affect cell proliferation by using cell number or how it affects cell size by using, for example, average cell size of the uh, population. But can we uh, detect how, whether these drugs affect the coordination between cell size and G1 length? So in order to do that, we need to uh, develop a method to estimate both cell size and G1 length for each of the individual drug condition in the screen. So in order to do that, we estimate G1 length based on the fact that we then the unsynchronized cell population, the G1 duration is relative to the proportion of cells in G1. And for people who are, have done uh, flow cytometry with DNA staining, you must be quite familiar with this. And following this, cell uh, conditions that made cells smaller tend to, would tend to have longer G1. Therefore, we expect to see a higher fraction of G1 cells. And conversely, conditions that made larger cells, uh, we should expect to see a lower G1 a shorter G1 duration or a lower fraction of G1 cells in these conditions. So in other words, we expect to observe a negative correlation between cell size and the corresponding G1 length across different uh, screen conditions. And this is exactly what we saw from the screen result. So each point here is an individual well, and this is from one of the 384 well plates. And on the x-axis, you have 
average cell size measured for the early G1 population. And for the y-axis, you have the proportion of cells in G1, which is a proxy of the G1 length. And we consistently observe this negative correlation between cell size and G1 length across all 80 screen plates, strongly confirming the dependency of G1 length on cell size. So now let's take a look at our method. So in our approach, we first examine the majority of these non hits, which together show a general correlation trend, uh, suggest so the hidden control mechanism linking these two phenotypes. So we now look for the compounds that would target this control mechanism. So what we do next is to identify the compound outliers that show different phenotypes in either cell size or G1 length, and we classify them into two types according to the relationship to this uh, general correlation trend. So the first type of hits like this one here, it increased cell size, but also proportionally decreased the fraction of G1 cells. So we think these compounds may perturb cell size or cell cycle, but still maintain the coordination between these two processes. And the second type of outliers like this one here, it stays far away from the correlation trend, and they are likely to perturb the coordination between size and G1 progression. So we call the first type on axis compounds, which may influence cell size or G1 length, but without perturbing the coordination, and the second type off axis compounds, which are likely to target the signaling pathways underlying them. So as I mentioned, all these compounds have been very well annotated. So I uh, did, performed uh, target enrichment analysis to examine for the overrepresented genes associated with these on axis and off axis phenotypes. And you see that, uh, very interestingly, the, on, the mTOR pathway are highly enriched for the on-axis phenotype. Actually, the, the top ones are almost exclusively from the mTOR pathway. So this, again, suggests that mTOR pathway, or the regulated cell protein translation and cell growth, it is not required to coordinate cell size and G1 progression. And conversely, we saw that multiple components of the P38 pathway to be highly enriched for the off-axis phenotype, uh, suggesting a role of the pathway to link size with G1. And the second evidence uh, comes from uh, analysis where we examine compounds that made cell size more variable. And we reasoned that an increase in cell size variation would suggest a perturbation in the control mechanism that buffers the deviation in size. So again, uh, we collect for these compound hits and we perform the target enrichment analysis. And I saw these uh, P38 pathway components are highly enriched and specifically MK2 a direct downstream substrate of P38 has been ranked as the top hit in this analysis. So this again suggests that P38 pathway functions to um, promote cell size homeostasis. The third piece of evidence comes from uh, the antibody screen, which is performed by Miriam, and she's here uh, today in the audience. So Miriam collected a panel of high quality antibodies and using information theory she examined under unperturbed conditions how the activity or level of these proteins associated with either cell cycle or cell size. Uh, and as kind of a confirmation, she saw that phosphohistone H3 is highly associated with only cell cycle, which makes sense. And this is a phosphoh S6, which is a component downstream mTOR pathway, is highly associated with cell size. And interestingly, these three highlighted uh, genes are components in the, M, uh, in the P38 pathway, and they are also highly associated with cell size, actually to an high, even higher level than M4 pathway component. So uh, instead of going into detailed analysis here, I, I'd like to show you one intuitive example of phosphor MSK1. So this is a scatter plot comparing the level of phosphor MSK1 versus cell size among G1 cells. So here, uh, each point here is a single cell, so Miriam measured cell size by using the protein dye and also the phosphor MSK1 level using the antibody. And she saw these cells with high phosphor MSK1 are almost exclusively small sized cells. So this suggests that the P38 pathway may be selectively activated in small but not large sized cells. So this evidence uh, suggests 
uh, a hypothesis where P38 pathway may function downstream of a cell side sensing uh, pathway to regulate G1S transition. And P38 pathway has actually been uh, studied in quite detail. Uh, it has been found that it plays numerous biological functions, including in cell cycle checkpoints. So for example, under DNA damage and oxidative stress, the P38 pathway is highly activated to induce a G1S arrest uh, by modulating uh, these substrates of P38, which also is the G1S regulators. So the link between P38 and G1S uh, transition has been quite well established. So what we need is really a link between P cell size and P38. Uh, but in literature, there is not so much uh, discussion about how cell size is regulated by P38 pathway. But I have so found some hints. So the first hint is that hyperosmotic conditions, which shrink cell volume, also strongly activate P38. Uh, it is unknown whether cell volume nor cell mass is co-regulated, but these two biophysical properties are clearly somehow linked. And also, the second hint, P38 upregulation has been shown to induce a large size phenotype. And this is true both in diseases like cardiac hypertrophy or uh, when P38 is artificially overexpressed, both in the yeast and in the mammalian cells. So in these two papers, the authors were uh, study how P30 overexpression caused uh, cell cycle uh, changes. And in the, in the figures, they show such a striking cell size phenotype, but it ha hasn't been really studied or even discussed uh, how P30 is related to cell size. So now we need to um, validate our model that P30 pathway is required to coordinate cell size with G1 progression. And we need to first establish an assay that we can quantify the coordination. And to do this, we modulate the level of mTOR pathway, which can help us to establish a bigger dynamic range of cell size and the corresponding G1 length. And on the basis of this, we perturb the P3 pathway to see if the coordination would be disturbed. So specifically, we titrate rapamycin to different doses and treat the cells with this different concentration uh, of rapamycin, which establish a very robust and clean negative correlation between cell size and G1 length. So here, each circle represents a population of thousands of cells where we treat it with a specific concentration of rapamycin. And as you see, as the rapamycin concentration goes higher, the cells should grow slower. They indeed have slightly smaller size, but they also because it's, they compensate with longer G1. So we use this as assay in our method, and we test a specific inhibitor of P38, and this is one of the striking results we saw during my study, and you see that the correlation between cell size and G1 length has been totally disrupted. So here again, these blue dots uh, are kind of like a negative control where they are only treated with a con rapamycin concentration series, and they can establish this negative correlation between size and control under wild type conditions. And these are the cells co-treated with both the rapamycin concentration series as well as the P38 inhibitor. So this suggests that small cells do not compensate with a longer G1 anymore. And indeed, these cells enter S phase prematurely. They proliferate much faster because they have a shorter G1 and in the end, they are smaller inside. And we have further tested a panel of specific inhibitors towards the MAP kinase pathways. And here, each panel uh, is the same as before. The blue dots are under wild type conditions, cells only treated with the rapamycin concentration series. And the red uh, circles are conditions co-treated with the rapamycin concentration series, as well as the indicated inhibitor. So you see that very consistently, uh, these are different concentrations, only inhibition over the P30 pathway, but not ERK or junk pathway disturb the coordination. So this strongly suggests that the P30 pathway function is required for the coordination. And uh, actually, if you look at uh, this panel under ERK inhibition, the cells, they, they indeed have a size phenotype. So these drugs are functional, but they shift the whole coordination to a bigger size value. And we also uh, inhibit the pathway uh, by genetic perturbations using SRN against upstream activators of P38. So that's include, 
uh, NKK3, 6, and 4, uh, which is activate P38. And as a comparison, we also uh, knocked down MKK7, which is upstream, only upstream of junk pathway. And similarly as before, we used the rapamycin concentration series as the assay to test the coordination. And as expected, we saw that knockdown of MKK3, 6, and 4 either perturb the coordination or weakens it, while knockdown of MKK7 leaves the relationship intact. And this is more clearly shown in this uh, figure that quantifies the slope between uh, size and G1 correlation. And you see that uh, knockdown of MKK7 has almost the same negative slope as in the control, while all three others have significantly higher slope. Uh, we have further tested knockdown of P38 isoforms. So in mammalian cells, there are four P38 isoforms, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And uh, quite to our surprise, P30 gamma and delta knockout had a much stronger phenotype compared to P30 alpha and beta. And this seems to suggest to us that these, two, these four P30 isoforms may have diverged in their function in cell size regulation. And kind of confirms this uh, hypothesis. Uh, I saw a paper published in 2016 where the authors uh, examined knockout, conditional knockout of P30 isoforms in heart mice, uh, in, in the heart of, of mice. And then they saw that knockout of P30 gamma and delta results in much smaller cardiomyocytes and smaller heart, but P30 alpha has no growth defects. So that's quite interesting to us. And what I've shown you so far have all been uh, measurements of size and G1 length at, as a bulk measurement. So in other words, Every measurement is uh, averaged across the population of cells. So I also wonder how this uh, correlation between size and G1 would be affected under single cell uh, resolution. So I repeat the time-lapse imaging experiments uh, where we can track the growth dynamics of each cell throughout the cell cycle. So here, each point here is a single cell, and we measure the initial size at birth and the corresponding G1 lens uh, according to the Gemini cell cycle reporter. So you see that, again, in control, you see this uh, weak but robust negative correlation. And under P30 inhibition, these cells have a much weakened correlation between the two phenotypes. So again, suggests that P30 pathway is required for this relationship. And actually, uh, it's not so clear here, but you would see that this uh, P30 inhibition indeed made a smaller cell size, and they have a shorter G1 but not S and G2, G2 phase. And as a comparison, this mTOR inhibitor also uh, makes cells smaller, but they actually made the correlation stronger, uh, potentially because they pose more cells under the cell size checkpoint. So, uh, so now I have shown you that the P30 pathway is required for the coordination between cell size and G1 length. Our hypothesis would also predict that if there's a reduction in cell size, uh, P3 pathway would be activated to uh, bring size back to normal. And kind of in, uh, suggest, support this, we found that inhibition of mTOR by rapamycin and taurin, which reduced cell size, indeed caused the upregulation of P38. But this could be due to an alternative explanation where P30 pathway is activated directly by inhibition of mTOR. So in order to test this uh, possibility, we developed a size recovery assay to separate in time the change in cell size from mTOR inhibition. So here is a cartoon of the experiment design. So the cells were first treated with taurin, uh, an mTOR inhibitor, for around 20 hours. And then we wash away the drug to let the cells recover in size. We use coater counter to monitor both the cell size, average cell size, and cell number, cell proliferation throughout the experiments. And as expected, we saw that cell size on average decreased in size. And then during the recovery phase, after uh, the washout of the drug, the cell size indeed start to recover and reach the same size as control in around a day. And interestingly, during this recovery phase, you saw that uh, cell proliferation is very slow. This suggests that cells uh, 
uh, they may be waiting there until they reach the right size to commit to the next cell cycle. And now we focus on this recovery phase where the cell size is still smaller, but they, have, uh, they are not subject to mTOR inhibition anymore. So we, uh, we examine the level of T38 MAP kinase pathway during the recovery phase. So here these numbers indicate the hours after washout of the drug. And you see that uh, both phospho P38 and phospho MSK1 are upregulated during the recovery phase. And the kinetics kind of mimic the recovery in cell size. And as a comparison, uh, you see mTOR pathway activity recovered within one hour after we wash away the drug. So this at least suggests that uh, P30 activation is not uh, because of the mTOR inhibition, but more likely it's because of the shrink in cell size. And as an, another way to more quantitatively measure P30 activity, we use the kinase translocation reporter, which is designed in this paper in 2014. And the design of the reporter is in the sense that if the reporter is phosphorylated by the kinase, it translocates from the nucleus to the cytosol. So we can use the cytoplasmic to nuclear ratio of the reporter as a readout of the uh, kinase activity. And luckily, in this paper, they developed both P38 and junk reporter. So we just purchased these reporters and express both of them in our cells. And again, uh, we treated cells with different rapamycin concentrations to est establish a bigger dynamic range of cell size. And we saw this negative correlation between cell size and P38 activity. So this suggests that smaller cells indeed have higher P38 level. And these orange dots are cells under uh, P30 inhibition. So they have overall lower P38 activity. And in these same cells, we also measure the junk activity and it's quite interesting, it's invariant across different cell size. And then again, we performed the, the recovery experiments. So six hours after we release the cells from the inhibition, and we still see this negative correlation between size and P38 activity maintains. While in junk uh, reporter, there's no such a relationship. So that's the majority of the results in my thesis. And we have more detailed experiments, which I described in my thesis. And then this work is also published last year at eLife. So uh, feel free to check it out. And it's in the um, open source journal. So you can check it out anytime. Uh, so in summary of this study, uh, we performed two parallel screens that identify the P30 pathway functions to promote cell size homeostasis. And we also performed validation experiments showing that inhibition of P38 disturbed the coordination between size and G1 length. And lastly, we show P30 pathway is selectively activated in abnormally sized, in small sized cells. And this suggests a model where P38 pathway function downstream of cell size to regulate G1S transition and overall promote cell size uh, homeostasis. Um, before I uh, finish, I'd like to take the last few minutes and to go back again to this general bigger picture question. How is cell size controlled? So what I've talked to you today have been focused on the homeostasis control of cell size. And this is critical for the cells to reach the same right size within the population. And I've told you that P38 pathway is important to promote the homeostasis of cell size by controlling cell cycle progression. And another paper published in our lab last year also shows that in order to reach this right size, cells not only control cell cycle, but also the rate of cell growth. And recently we have found interesting uh, uh, evidence suggesting that it is protein degradation rather than synthesis that's mostly important for this growth rate dependent uh, homeostasis control of cell size. So one direction of, uh, of the lab is now looking into that. And another very important aspect of cell size control is the target size, which can change quite dramatically under different conditions. So how is this set point of cell size controlled? And we know that, for example, under different nutrient level, cells can grow bigger or smaller to adapt to the environment. 
I also shown you that cells of different tissue types, they can be, they, they all have their unique target size. And uh, during cell differentiation, cells can change their size as well. One of the maybe most obvious example is during blood cell uh, differentiation, where the same stem cell can differentiate into a tiny uh, Israel uh, sites or a very large ma macrophage. So how, how the cells know what, how big they should be, right? And then lastly, uh, cell size can also change during the time of evolution, allowing different animals to have different sized cells. And actually, uh, in a recent paper published last year uh, by Yuval Doris Lab at Jerusalem University, they have looked at uh, cell size of SNR cells from different animals, which are quite different in size. So they are a collaborator lab uh, with RAN, and they are studying pancreas. So they contact, they, they are collaborating with the zoo and they obtain the samples of different animals. And when they look at the pancreas of these animals, what they, what's the most different thing they found is that the SNR cell size are so different among all these animals. So then they further look at what animal features is correlated with this cell size difference. And quite surprisingly, they found that cell size is correlated with lifespan, actually an active correlation. So here, each point is uh, a different species. T together, there are 24 mammalian species. And we are here, so niche, and <laughs> we're human at this end, where we have quite small uh, cell size, SNR cell size, and we live close to 100 years. And it, at the other uh, end, we have uh, mice, some rodents, uh, where they have much larger SNR cells, uh, but they only live two years. So how, why is cell size and lifespan correlated? No one knows about that. Uh, but this also poses a much uh, general question. How, how do cells code uh, or program their target size? So to answer this question, uh, there are some hints from my PhD study. So if you remember these results I showed you. So here, uh, the blue dots are cells treated with the rapamycin concentration series, where you, uh, you can see this negative correlation between cell size and G1 length. And then we used the assay to test P30 inhibitor or ERK inhibitor. And we saw that P30 inhibition results in a loss of the coordination, while ERK inhibition uh, maintains the coordination, but shifts cell size to bigger value. So this seems to suggest to me that P38 uh, functions to maintain cell size homeostasis, but ERK uh, is functioning maybe is to change cell size, right? So I teamed up with Cyril, a grad student in the lab, and we went to Novartis and did a follow-up screen on this using this assay. And we, we did it in three weeks because we have the help of a very high throughput screen system. Uh, it's quite an interesting experience because everything is so different from what's going on in our lab at the bench. <laughs> so, so this whole thing is a high throughput screening system. Actually, this is one of the smaller ones uh, there. Uh, you, you can actually walk in there and, and do, do things, but usually people don't walk in there. Uh, so in the center, actually, this is a video. Let me play it for you. So in the center, you see this yellow robot arm, uh, and it can move around, uh, put plates in and out. And this is an incubator where you can take plates in or out from the back. Uh, if you put the plate here, uh, this is a compound transfer machine, so you can do the drug treatment here. And there are, there are four washers. You can do feeding, fixation, or staining, and you can program the whole thing, uh, use the computers. So it's, it's quite an interesting experience. Here I said, hit the button and go home. <laughs> but it's not that simple. Uh, there are just so many technical details to figure out bet uh, before we can move forward. And actually, uh, we, we just made it within these three weeks to finish the screen. Uh, but we got quite nice result. And Ron uh, joined us later to uh, do analysis and things. And he had, has helped a lot. So this is the result that we see our assay worked very robustly in large scale screen format. So these are uh, conditions treated with the rapamycin concentration series. These are P30 inhibition, ERK inhibition. So quite nice. And we also recently obtained some very exciting new results as well. 
um, by Surreal and Rang. And so you see this really further suggests that uh, our hypothesis, uh, so if you look at the middle panel, these are cells treated with different rapamycin concentrations. So each line is on average how cell grow in size throughout the cell cycle. You see that higher rapamycin makes cell on average smaller, but, but there's a, such a constraint, clear, obvious constraint of cell size happening at G1S transition. Uh, so this suggests there seems to be really a cell size checkpoint. And if you look at the right, you see under P30 inhibition, the whole thing just disappears um, and everything just moves forward. And here under ERK inhibition, there, there's still you see this constraint of cell size, but the whole thing is moved up to a larger target size value. So this is quite exciting. And we're now are looking up more candidates uh, of these different aspects of cell size control. And also, uh, we are now expanding the realm of size control from individual cells to smaller or larger scales, to organelles or organs. And actually, during my PhD study, I found the size control of anything seems to be understudied. Um, so if you think about one most famous example is height. People are curious about this question since ancient time, but till today, we still do not know the biophysical and biochemical mechanism that controls our, our height. And for cell size and organ size, like people also know quite little about them. So um, I'm quite lucky to uh, team up with Shula uh, to start this really exciting project to study kidney size control and how cell size and organ size co is co-regulated. So in our body, we know we have two kidneys and they function to filter waste in our body. And you can choose to donate one kidney to other people if, if needed. And the remaining kidney can still function and you can still be healthy. But after you donate one kidney, the, the remaining one will grow over 30% in size within two weeks after removal of the other kidney. So this is really uh, quite striking. But people know this since maybe 30 years ago or, or even longer uh, because people have done this kidney transfer uh, surgery and things like that. And 30 years ago, people have done very crude analysis. They show that it is cell size, growth in cell size rather than cell number uh, that contribute to this kidney growth. But very little is known till today about the mechanisms involved in this. Actually, people don't even know whether different cell types in the kidney grow to the same extent or not. And one, one reason is really because kidney is such a complex organ. It's made of many uh, these single cell layer tubules, so making it quite difficult to study, uh, especially in, during adult. Uh, but, so, but now I think uh, our techniques are real, actually ready to tackle these difficult but very important questions. So I feel we can uh, really move forward towards this and open new frontiers uh, to study uh, size control and homeostasis of uh, cell size and organ size uh, in adulthood. And this is just very preliminary data where we, we are examining uh, cell size uh, using imaging. So this is kidney section and stand by E. cadherin. We also had other labels of different uh, cell types and the nucleus I'm not showing here for clarity. And this is imaged by Shula and we can identify these different tubule types. So this is a glomerulus. These ones are proximal tubule and some distal tubule. And then we can identify each individual cells there and estimate uh, cell size during the process of kidney compensatory growth. So this is at the very beginning stage, but uh, I felt really excited about this, the development of this project. So with that, I'd like to thank all the people who have helped me, helped me during this process. It's really a very uh, collaborative effort. And especially I want to thank Ren, who has been such a great mentor. I'm very proud uh, to be his first student and uh, I think I, I really learned a lot. I hope he can also be proud of me in the future. <laughs> and Nish has also uh, given me tremendous help during this process. 
Uh, he has trained me in several experiments, helped me design some of these experiments, interpret the results. I can't imagine how my project would end up without Nish. And Miriam has um, helped, for sure, I already mentioned that she did this antibody screen, and she also involved a lot in the initial stage of the project when she were uh, working with Ryan at Harvard. And uh, Bosco has helped with, and Bosco and Nancy, both of them have helped with the recovery experiments. Cyril have helped me with the time-lapse imaging, but she also helped me in all different kind of ways. Um, and Eden has always cheered me up when I was in the down mood. <laughs> and we also have so more, um, many more people join who have helped me a lot. Uh, this is an old figure. We should actually have a new lab uh, picture now. Um, and and I also had the help of so many collaborators. Um, so here are Jeremy, Ivan, and Mark. They are from Novartis. They have helped me with the drug annotation and also the follow-up screen. Yan and Larry, a statistician uh, from CMU, they helped me with the on-axis and off-axis uh, uh, statistical analysis. Yan is now a professor at uh, University of Washington now, has his own lab. Uh, Jen Da is my boyfriend, but also a collaborator. Uh, he, he, he's such a, a great thinker, I think. Uh, I always turn to him to consultation, discussion, brainstorm, and he's always so helpful. Uh, and, and Ryan again. Uh, this just shows you how, what, who Ryan is, and he's, he's a friend to, to us and everyone, including the Moose. And this is a picture I'm taking. He's showing results uh, to, to the moose. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Uh, please feel free to ask us. And for sure, I, uh, I want to thank uh, my committee members and Wallace as well. Wallace has, has given me so much help. Like He has invited me several times to, uh, to his conference. And I met so many new people, had new ideas. Actually. Wallace also inspired me to study kidney. He has his own model of uh, kidney <laughs> branch hemophagenesis. That's, that's one of the initial points where I got interest in kidney. Um, but yeah. <laughs> OK, so we're now open to questions. Thanks. We should use the, the mic. Okay. So can hear. Okay. Uh, any questions? Mike. Oh, sorry. So you mentioned that ERK inhibition causes uh, cell size to be bigger. Have you ever looked at uh, the P38 activity when you inhibit ERK? Uh, we haven't looked at that yet, yeah. but there people know there is actually feedback regulation between ERK and P38. I think it's really interesting. I, I think uh, target size and size homeostasis, I think they're separate set of genes that regulate them, but they should definitely have crosstalk. So I'm not sure if P38 and ERK crosstalk is that, but maybe it's, uh, it play a role there. Very good question. Any other question? Please. So uh, I'm quite interested uh, in the graph about the lifespan and the cell yeah. size. Mm -hmm. But that's uh, the lifespan of animals, right? Have you uh, studied the lifespan of cells? I, I guess the cell you are using is in models, so. Yeah, that's uh, a very interesting question. Actually, I, I, when I was writing my thesis, I was thinking about cell size and lifespan. And I also look at cell size in stem cells. And then I found most of these stem cells usually tend to be small in size, especially like the adult stem cells. They're usually small. And actually in, in yes, I'm small. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to mention one word. Uh, in yeast, um, you have a replication lifespan. And smaller yeast tend to replicate for longer uh, cycles, more cycles. And larger uh, yeast replicate fewer cycles. This is uh, both in natural variation as well as in genetic modification. So there seems to be some link there as well. Yeah. 
So I apologize if this is a very, very basic question for you, but this isn't my field. I'm just interested in it. Uh, but why do, do we know why small cells have a longer G1 and, and larger cells have a shorter G1? For some reason, that just doesn't make sense to me. I'm wondering if this is something that's really obvious that I'm just missing. Why does it not make sense to you? Why, why did you intuition go the other way? <laughs> I, I don't know. I just don't know enough about this, this field. It's probably a very simple answer. Okay, so I think the first thing is that there is an observation. Uh, first thing is, uh, for both in yeast and in mammalian cells, that smaller cells tend to grow for longer. And now, what, what are the molecular mechanisms? So my, my project studies what are the genes involved in this process and show that P38 is involved. But then what is the biophysical mechanism? So for example, how do cells know they are too small to have longer G1? So I don't think that has been resolved yet. There are many models about that. So some of the models suggest uh, like a dilution of G1 inhibitors uh, or cell cycle inhibitors when cells grow bigger or something like that. But all these are not so conclusive yet. Just do I answer your question? Okay, another question. Yeah. A very interesting model. I have a like, simple question about uh, like the uncontrolled cell proliferation. Like in tumor condition, the cell size can't control anymore. So from your model, how to explain this? Like, why in normal there's a side side control, but in tumor things everything is disrupt, and the tumor the, the cell next like, organ will grow uh, uncontrollably and uh, eventually will kill the animal and things next. Yeah, species. it's very interesting how cell size uniformity is related to, to diseases like tumor. Um, so there are some tumors that cells become cells cell size become quite variable. Uh, like uh, melanoma, I think, is one type. But there are other tumors that cell size is, seems to be still regulated. So, for example, we look at HeLa cells. They still have this size control mechanism, not as good as other more normal cells. Because the HeLa cells are in vitro for so long time, it's not like tumor cell anymore. But like in vivo, tumor still have the... Like in vivo, like the tumor still have the microenvironment, like the seed like stimulation. So, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, if like, some I, people say Hila is an, another species now. I, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I don't know whether, but I think in, in tumor, there, so firstly, there are so many causes of tumor. I think some of them is related to growth defects, mm -hmm. including maybe cell size. Yeah. Others, maybe it's, it's not. Yeah. That's my so, like in 2D and 3D culturing, like the cell growth, maybe the, because the difference of the microenvironment. Will call, next we'll activate the different parts. Next PF next thirteen eight pathway will activate different unit depends on the micro environment. Do you think this is also possible about that? I think there are, there should be definitely uh, changes uh, if cells are cut in two D and three D. Uh, I think what people also show that different extracellular matrix cause different cell size. Mm -hmm. I think if the matrix is harder than I don't remember like if it's smaller or bigger, but but people seem to use this as a way to manipulate cell size now in, in these different uh, types, like stem cells or things like that. Interesting. Thank you. Okay, we have time maybe for two more questions, and that's it. Anybody else want to ask a question? Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's known that like cell cell contacts and interaction are pretty important for determining cell growth. Do you think there's any relationship with cell size? And then in that sense, do you think there's maybe differences between adherent cells and cells that grow in suspension like blood cells? A very interesting question. So definitely contact inhibition cause smaller cell size. So for example, in our cell culture, we use uh, epithelial cells. Uh, and when they become very confluent, they became smaller in size. But uh, over most of the conference level, they are relatively co constant in size and then they become smaller. And then they also, there's an inhibition of towards cell cycle as well. Um, towards suspended cells versus, um, I, I'm not sure. Um, there are some papers studying blood cells and actually um, they show there is growth rate dependent regulation of cell size. I don't know too much about how they regulate cell cycle as well. Uh, maybe also, depending on cell type, it's a little bit different as well. Okay, last question, if anybody has. 
Any last question or we'll end? Okay. Okay. Um, so thanks so much. And I already am proud of you, so you don't need to labor anymore. <laughs> and thank you also, Marshall, uh, uh, for joining. And thank you, the committee members and everybody for uh, following this study up until now. Thank you.